an indigenous script says we belong we have a place on the earth as soon as a culture is prevented from using their own script not only does this mean that within two generations everything that's been written in that script is incomprehensible to the entire culture that created it but it also means that they don't have that sign that they can see everywhere that they said that says yeah this is our place this is where we've lived for hundreds or thousands of years you know we we deserve that uh, recognition and respect <laughs> Welcome, Tim. How's everything going? Uh, it's actually, it's an amazing time right now because I'm in the middle of doing three talks for the Library of Congress. Uh. And I did one two days ago. Um, and it was extremely successful. And they're, they're really psyched. The stuff that I talk about, of course, is uh, of great interest to librarians and people who are interested in the fact that I'm coming at it from some very, very unusual directions seems to have made them very excited. So there's a, it's a time of, of fervor and ferment. How many languages do you speak? Oh, <laughs> okay. So you have to realize that my operation is in like the worst possible hands um, because I mean, I speak um, high school French and German, and I know how to swear in Spanish, and uh, I, I can read a bit of Latin, but um, I, I'm just gonna show you Okay. around the room and uh, I'm just going to move my laptop a little bit and so I've got all these carvings up on the walls here mm -hmm. um, and uh, so here we are and um, there's one over here and uh -huh. people say oh do you do you speak all of those languages and I say no I don't speak any of them um, yeah <laughs> I've sort of taken this on as a, a joy and a project and really my life's work but um i'm not an anthropologist i'm not a linguist i have no background actually as a woodworker even um, i'm a writer and a guitarist um, <laughs> all of this is stuff that i'm learning as i'm going along and the frankly the fact that I don't have traditional training in these areas has turned out to be enormously valuable because I ask questions that um, the, the professionals don't. And in particular, by carving a piece of writing in wood, it forces you to not only look at it and be with it, but also to think about it and to recognize certain features of it as an extension of the human hand, as an extension of the shoulder, the physics of the act of writing. Um, right. it's, there are many, many things that have come out of this simply because I'm going about it in a strange way. I would have assumed you spoke like all these different languages, but how do you, <laughs> get, how do you get interested in, in languages? I mean, I can understand, you know, uh, high school French, guitar, dead languages or, or almost lost or languages. Swearing. And also some swearing, I think. Yeah. Um, yes, anybody who does any carving swears sooner or later. Um, yeah, so it all began um, like all acts of genius, completely by accident. Um, so this started about 12 years ago. Uh, Christmas was coming up and uh, I had no money. Luckily, I grew up very poor and my um, my family, would we would always make Christmas presents, you know, for each other. Right. And so I thought, okay, I'll make Christmas presents. And my then wife wanted a, a shingle to hang outside her therapy practice and so i thought i'll carve her one i'll try i'll try carving her one right and as i was doing that my um older daughter who was a senior at RISD, said she wanted a sign to go up above her table at the senior show so she could sell some merchandise that she had designed and then my younger <laughs> daughter said she wanted a sign and and pretty much everybody in my family it was like oh yeah that this is this is christmas so then having done that and discovered that I really enjoyed it and people liked them, I then started um, carving people little monograms in, in Chinese characters. And what I discovered was that the act of carving a Chinese character is completely different from the act of carving something in the Latin alphabet because the Latin alphabet is essentially created mechanically. It's based on inscriptions on the tombs of Roman emperors, which were made with straight edges and right angles and, and mechanical devices. And Chinese is a script, which right. is 
an extension of the movement of the of the human hand and the, and the movement of the brush. And so I just started getting interested in this and I wound up doing more carvings. And then I discovered on omniglot.com that probably at the time, I thought maybe a third of the world's alphabets were like no longer taught in schools, no longer used for official purposes, in some cases outright banned. And I thought I'm gonna carve some of these just as a way of drawing attention to this issue and discovered that no one else in the world was asking this question, you know, what, what is happening to the world's alphabets? Why were they banned? Writing is such a manifestation of individual and cultural identity that it becomes a, a tool in any power struggle. And so, for example, at least two occasions in India, there have been power struggles where um, a ruling party or ruling a, a ruler has ordered that anything written in any other than the official script be burned and anybody writing in it be thrown into jail. As recently as you know, mid 20th century, we know of at least four people who have created writing systems for their culture, for their people, for you know, for their language culture, who have been killed and others who have been um, thrown in jail, even as recently as 20th century. So writing is so deeply embedded in our sense of who we are and what is important, because after all, if something is important, we write it down, right? So it's a selective thing that when we see the letters that we are used to recording these, um, th these important um, elements in, they mean something to us, even if we can no longer read them. So you go to Ireland and you can buy trinkets um, like earrings in, in the Oem script, even though nobody can read that and it hasn't even been fully deciphered. You go to Croatia and there is a sculpture park. This is like a multiple kilometer walk um, up on the mountains above the, the, uh, the sea. There are these huge sculptures of letters in the glagolitic script even though virtually nobody uses that script anymore because it is so much a visual reminder of the identity of the people. Wow. Have, you, have you gone there? I was there before it was built, hence the gray hairs. Um, right. But I, yes, I was actually hoping to go there during the, the COVID summer. I was going to go there or Mongolia, um, but right. neither of those happened. What is it? What is on the website exactly? So we have two websites, um, sister websites. The, the one that I like to send people to um, first is endangeredalphabets.net. So that is our online atlas of endangered alphabets. So after I started doing these carvings and going out and doing exhibitions and talkings about this, people would say to me, you know, this is unbelievable. I had no idea about this stuff. Where can I find out more about it? And there really wasn't anywhere. So we created um, a website uh, based on a, a Google Maps type plugin where you go there and you can see, you know, the world map and there are pins dropped all over the place and you click on the pin and then it takes you to a profile of that particular script and a gallery of, of examples of it, and then links that um, tell you more about it or places you can go to learn it or right. um, articles of that kind. Now, what, that's what's in it. What isn't in it? That's a great question. There are several things that are not in it. I don't deal with extinct scripts because this is really an issue of it's an issue of human rights and social justice as much as anything else. Um, in a sense, it's more that than it is linguistics. And so anything that's really extinct um, is sort of beyond my range. What else isn't in it is all of the mainstream languages and scripts that people are steered towards every day. Um, so I'm really interested in, you know, the word riparian, you know, the, the stuff that exists on the coastline between one and the other. I'm interested in everything that's happening right there on the edge. And that's really two different kinds of things. One is scripts that are endangered and one is new scripts or scripts that are being revitalized. In the last five years alone, there has been this extraordinary revitalization all over the world 
um, interest in indigenous cultures, minority cultures, and the manifestations of those cultures. And writing systems and languages are, are right up there. It's 10 years ago, I called this the Endangered Alphabets Project. That's already beginning to seem a little dated because so much is happening right now. So that, that's an important thing that you bring up, right? And we're seeing it now even more and more, this sort of all of the identities, people really wanting to, to really, A, look at their heritage, their roots, and then, you know, how, and so are you seeing an uptick and are more of these uh, endangered, if you will, alphabets showing up? Um, you know, what sort of, what's happening just as a progression? Yes. So um, different things are happening all over the place and it very much depends on the culture and um, the, the local power systems. So for example, if you go to Tahlequah, Oklahoma, um, and you go downtown, then the street signs there, um, a number of them are in, um, in English and in Cherokee. The post office has a sign in Cherokee. The Bank of America downtown has Bank of America in Cherokee. Um, because Tahlequah is the home of the Cherokee nation, or at least the, the, the Western um, part. In India, what you'll find is that um, there will often be one person who is so committed to his culture's identity, because it's usually a guy, that he's created a script for his people. And in fact, he may well have created glyphs or letters that have symbols that are familiar, like the shape of a hornbill's beak, for example, or, or something so it's easier to learn. And that person may be just teaching it through a Facebook group to 20 other people. Um, the dedication that people are showing is amazing. You get people um, who are in extremely oppressed minorities who are teaching themselves how to digitize and uh, create um, fonts that can be used for a minority script. So it can be, you know, on Android, for example. It's a time of um, great struggle, but also great energy. Because you were talking about the, the writing part, you know, the hand, the written part, but now we're having to digitize. And I, I was just thinking of places, let's say in Myanmar or whatever, where people are trying to get each other's messages and they're using these other languages also as code. But I, I don't even know if that applies as an idea, so. Well, actually, I, I'll, I'll pick up on that idea and take one step sideways, if I may. So one of the really, really interesting questions is how is the digital revolution affecting all of this? There's kind of a, con all of the world's writing systems are on a continuum somewhere between at one end, something that is very indigenous, very based and rooted in local culture, very graphic probably, possibly very expressive, very individual. And at the other end, you've got something that is very uniform, very widely usable, very kind of mathematical and designed. And so when you take an indigenous script and you digitize it, you literally have to fit all of those letters, all of those characters into little boxes of the same size. So the plus of that is that you can then um, adapt it and you can be in a position where people in a minority group like the Zagawa people from Sudan and Chad, they now have a font which they can use on a phone, which means they can text each other without having to go through Arabic or through Latin, you know, to be able to bypass the language of power or the, the alphabet of power is an extraordinary thing. But at the same time, what you're losing is the flavor of some of these scripts where they are totally unique to that people in that area. An indigenous script says, we belong. You know, we, we have a place on the earth and it identifies it and says, um, we deserve respect. And as soon as a culture is prevented from using their own script, not only does this mean that within two generations, everything that's been written in that script is incomprehensible to the entire culture that created it, but it also means that they don't have that sign that they can see everywhere that they said that says, yeah, this is our place. This is where we've lived for hundreds or thousands of years. You know, we, we deserve that uh, recognition and respect. I mean, I guess that the internet is a great democratizing tool, but certain things are going to be lost as we homogenize out over a greater and greater number of people. So 
What are we really holding on to when we hold on to history and why is it so important? Okay, two things. First of all, you're absolutely right. The internet has, and this is often true of many things, has two opposite effects simultaneously. On the one hand, it means that if you want to do business on the internet, you pretty much have to do it in a, a small number of languages and scripts because the vast majority of websites are in those scripts. And the coding at the heart of the internet, of course, is in, in, in Latin by and large, the script. But on the other hand, I could never have done this research without the internet to help me. And I spend most of my time on social media reaching out to find people who are in these minority communities, many of whom have very, very little internet footprint. And if I were doing that research 50 years ago, you know, it would be impossible. I would be writing letters to people and hoping that they got to, you know, the foothills of the Himalayas and found a small group of 20,000 people speaking one language. If I read uh, Rambeau or Verlaine, you know, I think of that as, in my mind, it's in English and it's poetry in English, but those translations are so difficult to get to English. You know, have you seen examples where great poems in these other languages and seen them translated out to us or taking great poems and tried to translate them into those languages? So I'll give you an example from Vietnam. So for about a thousand years, the script that was used in Vietnam was a, a, a version of the Chinese script. In the 18th century, one of the great poets in world history, who was a woman, very, very unusually, you know, for, for Asia or Southeast Asia, uh, a remarkable uh, poet, sort of the, the Sappho of, of Vietnam. And she was writing in this script, uh, which was called Chu Nom. As you know, the Chinese script encodes different kinds of information to other scripts. It encodes something about the, the history and origins and the development of, of the word as well as uh, you know, pronunciation um, uh, guide to translate her poetry out of the Chunom script into the Latin or the version of the Latin script the Vietnamese now use is sort of virtually impossible. So one of the things that um, is misleading about the whole translation industry is that we sort of assume that a good translator can um, take meaning from one language and put it into another. But if the visual symbols themselves are part of the meaning, then that's like saying, how would you translate a painting? And in Africa, you have a number of scripts where what they're doing is conveying meaning, not with what we think of as letters, in other words, symbols that have sounds, but um, by using symbols that themselves are a kind of a shorthand that have ideographic meaning, um, that can be understood by people who are speaking multiple different languages from the region. They're kind of like European road signs, you know, right. that really expands our sense of what writing actually is or could be. This is institutional memory, right? It's the memory of the place. Like if you're not out collecting these languages, you know, are they, you know, will they just eventually fade out? How do you collect them? Is that a a person saying the language? Is it a, a written pictograph? Is it, you know, how do I record a language for right. you? Again, I want to stress the difference between languages and scripts, right? So endangered languages, that's a pretty well-defined field now. It's been going since, it was pretty much invented in Australia in the 1960s. So that's pretty well. Endangered alphabets is something that has a lot of overlap, but is in many ways completely different. Um, and so to give you an example of how hard it would be to capture this, as you say, this cultural knowledge and wisdom. In Angola and in the surrounding areas of the Congo, uh, the Chokwe people have a storytelling tradition uh, in which there are, there are storytellers who educate boys as they enter puberty. And what they do is they go down, uh, down to the river uh, where there's some, you know, some damp sand. And what they do is they do this. They hold up two fingers mm -hmm. and they use them as a spacer mm -hmm. to make dots in the sand. So they go like this and like this and like mm -hmm. this. So they're creating a geometrical pattern of dots. 
And each of these stories that gets told can, conveys a, a different piece of traditional uh, wisdom, but it's also got a different pattern of dots. So then what happens is that the storyteller squats down and the boy squats down as well. And the storyteller takes his finger and starts tracing a line around the dots and between the dots. This is literally the storyline. And it's mesmerizing because it, you watch it moving. So you're listening to the tale develop. And just as the tale may take unexpected twists, then the line will take unexpected twists. Some of the dots may represent animals or places or people. Some of them are just representing the journey that mm. is taking place in the story. So like all good stories, it ends up where it started, except that the person has gone on this journey. The line never goes back over itself and it never, never duplicates and it completes this pattern. That pattern will be lost, you know, because the sand will, you know, will, will sort of um, wash it away. But it's not just writing and it's not just an illustration. It's actually an animation, because if you um, watch these things taking place, the drama of the story is actually being played out visually as well. And so you can sort of go, wait a second, writing doesn't do this. Writing is is just symbols that, that represent sounds. And even the pattern itself is the final product. It doesn't have the kind of the drama of the storytelling. So here's right. one of the ones that I've done. Mm -hmm. This is, this is, so this is House of a Man and Two Women. And Wait. as soon as you look at it, you kind of go, I know exactly what's going on there. Yeah, so yeah. that's a, that's a interesting situation. Exactly. And you notice that none of the lines go between the women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. They're the, separate. He's got it. And the women are much um, larger than the man and mm -hmm. much more kind of uh, vociferous. And um, I think, although I don't know, that the larger of the circles is probably the house and mm -hmm. the smaller circles probably sort of represent the man's head. You know, so everything, it's his job to try and deal with this, the, the, this sort of tension between these two people. So there you kind of go, um, that is something that is so um, deep, but also so fragile mm -hmm. that unless you are paying really, really good attention, you first of all, you think it's just primitive. You know, this is just drawings in the sand. Right. You don't, this is actually so sophisticated. There's now a branch of mathematics devoted mm -hmm. to this particular um, patterning and and the equations involved in being able to create that pattern without duplicating and stuff like that how old was that well, do we know when that was done so there are very very few storytellers left they've probably been doing it for hundreds of years but again this isn't the kind of thing that anybody's keeping documentary records and and anybody from you know european civilization who goes there is likely to dismiss this as you know just kind of primitive nonsense rather than recognizing it as being an extraordinarily sophisticated means of communicating information. Now, how do you, how do you record that for future generations? Because without context, it just looks like a bunch of dots on the page. As I say, I, this is actually a subject of frustration for me because there is a YouTube channel called Lusona, L-U-S-O-N-A in which somebody has actually made a series of animations in which the story is told as the line is drawn. And they're fantastic. I cannot find out who did that. I have, you know, done everything I can to try and track down the person who made those because that person really is, short of actually filming a storyteller, telling the story, you know, at the river's edge, that's the next best thing. These languages could just disappear you know, everything is sort of disappearing, you know, when everything is available, things sort of start to take on less importance. So is this a similar idea to, to save this in a sense, become institutional memory of these, these rare alphabets? My initial intent um, was to um, just start raising this as an issue, because as I say, there isn't anybody else who's doing this at all. So just to sort of put it on the, on the, um, on the airwave, so to speak. And um, my first exhibition, I carved um, Article One of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in a dozen of these um, 
uh, what I thought of as endangered alphabets. How long does that take you? And a year and a half. Wow. It really has made me an activist. And um, especially when you hear the story from their side, then you then everything suddenly makes sense. It's sort of like if you talk to a group of people about, say, the spotted owl, and some people say, oh, who cares? And some people say, oh, it'd be a shame if they were extinct. But if you talk to a group of spotted owls, <laughs> then everything makes sense. And um, I worked on um, a series of projects with um, indigenous people in the Chittagong Hill Tracks of Bangladesh and just getting to see how their villages, their communities, their history, their language are being marginalized by more powerful groups in the region or by the government, it sort of turned me around completely. So what I did there, for example, was to work with people to create educational materials in those scripts. And so we did uh, classroom materials, we did wall charts, we did, um, we produced the first coloring books that, that now, they did you, ever seen. Did you speak English to them or how, what language did you oh, communicate yeah. in? Um, so yes, as I say, my, my, I'm embarrassed every day by the fact that the people I'm working with speak um, English better than, you know, better than I speak any other language and it's their <laughs> sixth language, you yeah. know. Um, now, how many different, now these groups over the last years have you, mm -hmm. year, have you been communicating with them over over uh, Zoom during the last year? Are you still able to keep in contact? I discovered two new writing systems, two new scripts, just in the last week. Hmm. And, and in theory, I know more about this than anybody else. And yet people say, oh, did you know about this one? And I'm kind of going, somebody is creating a syllabary to write the indigenous languages of the Amazon jungle. Wow. How did I not know about that, right? So, um, yes. What I'm doing then is just constantly trying to, to, to sort of draw stuff in, to write it up, to put it back out again. I introduce people to um, the people who, uh, to folks who are more technical than I, who can actually help them do digitization mm -hmm. or, um, you know, put the script on their phone. Since last autumn, I've made my central priority um, the, uh, the traditional writing system of the Mongols, which is this unbelievably beautiful vertical script, which is very, very calligraphic. Mm -hmm. And it has been um, essentially eradicated in some of the Mongol lands. So most of the Mongols who live in Russia now no longer read and write it. Right. In Mongolia, uh, which became, you know, under the thumb of the Soviet Union around the Second World War, most people don't write it there. Only in what's called Inner Mongolia, which is a province now in China, do they still use it. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese have just announced that essentially they're going to um, try to replace it with Chinese. Mm -hmm. And this is a script the Mongols have been using, you know, since um, 850 years ago and represents everything that they are and everything that their history is. So we, we decided we would create um, some games. These are games that um, reinforce and educate about the, not only the Mongol language and script, but also the culture, the mythology, the history. It's an extraordinary culture, very rich in, in Buddhism, for example, incredibly rich culturally it's the home of most of the like most important dinosaur discoveries yeah. so are you finding similarities in these alphabets that you wouldn't necessarily think that lead you to think this is maybe an organizing principle for how human beings think not really and that isn't the point so the point really uh, the, the the organizing principle is really about power and social justice the fact that um, the reason why these scripts are rising or falling or being banned or being revived, that's pretty universal. Writing is generally thought to have started in three or four different places for, for three or four totally different reasons. When we think of writing, and by we, I mean 21st century people in the West, because we use writing in a very functional and everyday fashion, we tend to assume that that's what writing is. And so the earliest, um, the earliest writing in Mesopotamia, we've sort of identified that that seems to have been used for the purposes of accountancy, for keeping track of materials and goods and all this kind of stuff. So you'll read a lot of people who say, this is why writing was invented. But the fact is, 
that's what we see and therefore that's how we think of it. In China, writing was invented as an adjunct to divination and sorcery and magic. And it has extraordinarily deep spiritual qualities in the very shapes of the letter. In Mesoamerica, you have a different form of writing evolving um, different ways for different purposes. And even today, when people are inventing and creating new scripts, the principles they use may vary from those. Once you leave home and you get out amongst the endangered alphabets and you see what writing can be and has been and could be, you start realizing that our development of writing has actually become narrower and narrower and more and more focused on one set of purposes, which is abstract symbols to represent sounds. That actually is based on a Victorian principle that said any other kind of writing was childish, was primitive, and therefore it was not suitable for abstract rational thought. Seriously, for up until really recently, there were linguists who argued that the Chinese were not capable of abstract and rational thought because they were not using abstract symbols for their language. Our use of writing has become more and more kind of um, black and white and, and abstract. Like if you were at graduate school 15 years ago, you everything you turned in had to be in Times New Roman, you know, 12 point or whatever, right? It's extremely uh, narrow and, and focused. So what is happening here is a reaction against that. And it began when people first started getting PCs that came with font bundles. And so people started wanting their writing to look interesting. And then what happened was the rise of the emoji, which is the most rapidly growing visual symbol in the world. And what, what that really does is to say, you know, if you are trying to convey an emotion in writing, it takes skill, it takes a lot of works, it takes words, it takes time, right? Now what we're doing is we're bringing those two elements, the graphic and the verbal, back together and we're combining them so that you can, you're texting someone and you write a few words because you want to convey something of precise meaning and then you bang a couple of emojis in there because you want to use color and emotion and drama and that is, that is a real revolution in writing. How do we encourage people to, to walk about these languages? They can go to, go to endangeredalphabets.net, that's for sure. Um, when you see something that is clearly writing, but you can't read it or pronounce it or anything like that, the first reflex is just frustration, you know, confusion and frustration. Mm -hmm. But if you can get around that and you start looking at this stuff, it becomes like listening to unfamiliar music. You start uh. going, huh, that is really cool. So this ribbon shape here is because they were using this particular kind of read you know, when they were, when they were writing or this, it, this was vertical um, because it, it grew out of, you know, the use of, of columns and stone and stuff like that. So all of a sudden you start seeing more and you start taking more in. It's been such a wonderful conversation, Tim. Thank you so much, Tim. It's wonderful. So exciting. And everybody, yeah. please go to the website, please. And yeah. look, it's a beautiful place to play around and, and just visually it's great. Thanks for your interest. Our pleasure.